The Coin Week podcast has a new sponsor. If you've paid attention to the market or read our analysis of major coin sales in recent years, you know that CAC has changed the landscape for certified coins. Folks, it's true. The grading services do a fantastic service for our hobby, but in the market where originality, quality, and strict grading standards matters, you need to know that the coins you buy meet a higher standard. And coins certified by CAC have consistently brought more money at auction than coins without. So before you buy, do your homework and look for the green bean on the holder. It could make the difference between buying a coin that will hold its value and even make you money versus a coin that might have problems not evident alone with the grade. Hi, Beth. Thanks for joining me on the Coin Week podcast. Thank you. It's great to be with you. For our listeners, uh, and I'm pretty sure anybody who uh, listens to a coin podcast that runs between a half an hour and an hour long is already well familiar with your work. But for a handful of people who may not know, uh, Beth is the director of the Anti-Counterfeiting Task Force, uh, a group uh, comprised of experts uh, which has gathered to help the Industry Council of Tangible Assets to promote and safeguard the interests of the rare coin and bullion industry. Before that, she uh, has led a long and distinguished career as a journalist. For her career as a numismatist, Beth is the recipient of numerous industry awards, including the NLG Clemmy Award and the PNG Lifetime Achievement Award. She is a member of the American Numismatic Association's Numismatic Hall of Fame. And her work as editor of Coin World continued an impressive legacy of excellence that began with her predecessor, Margot Russell. Beth is the author of Making the Grade and Cash in Your Coins, Selling the Rare Coins You've Inherited. So Beth, uh, seems like uh, you've come a long way since your time working in the newspaper business in Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, yes, actually, if someone had told me early in my career that I would spend most of it uh, uh, writing about coins, I would have probably thought, uh, said, hey, you got the wrong person. <laughs> but, uh, you know, life has a way of um, bringing you to certain paths. And, and uh, when I uh, came to Sydney, Ohio, originally to work with the daily newspaper there, and was intro introduced to Margot, and she uh, – talked me into coming over to work for Coin World. A uh, whole new world opened to me, and uh, I just uh, have have really loved every minute of it. The, the people involved in numismatics, the people in the hobby and the marketplace, um, embraced me and, and taught me a lot. And uh, it's just a fascinating world, and it, and it has been uh, a richly rewarding career uh, from the standpoint of I don't think I have spent a day involved in coins without learning something. Most of the time I learn more than one fact or uh, about one new area, which uh, I think that is one of the great uh, attributes of, of becoming involved with uh, coins and numismatics and the people uh, who are in our world. You know, it's interesting, but a, a few years before the start of your numismatic career, the threat of counterfeit coins in the market was very real. It led the ANA to introduce an authentication service, which was the uh, progenitor of the ANA's grading service, uh, ANAX, uh, which then led to the development of the for-profit grading services, PCGS and then NGC. Uh, several others in that segment have fallen by the wayside. And obviously, this development was done to establish even more arbitrage for coins of different qualities, but was also done to combat counterfeit coins. How would you say the threat of counterfeit coins today differs from what the industry was dealing with in those pre-third-party grading service days? Well, I think the primary difference is the uh, availability. Uh, back in the 70s, um, the, the counterfeit entered um, either by people traveling to the Middle East or through some networks that 
were nowhere near as sophisticated as what we are looking at today. And um, I first became aware of the growing threats of counterfeits, uh, really by readers in CoinWorld, who were were telling us, hey, I got this counterfeit, I bought it online, and um, this was back in late 2007. And uh, we uh, began to get inquiries from people, and that led to uh, working with uh, Susan Headley, who at the time was doing the About Coins uh, site for uh, the New York Times. And um, we teamed to do a year-long investigation. And um, she had uncovered some information. We had information from readers and dealers. And that put us on uh, a, a quest to find, actually make contact with the counterfeiters to understand exactly how they were uh, producing uh, the coins. Some of them were very obvious at the beginning. Most any person who had um, a, a fairly good uh, understanding of coins and how they were made could spot the counterfeits. But we had begun to see at that time some very sophisticated coins. And um, she made contact with um, a, a guy in China who claimed to be the largest uh, counterfeiter. He didn't call himself a counterfeiter. Uh, he proudly uh, sent us a copy of a license that the government in China issued to him to make replicas. And every time we tried to tell him about our, our laws, that if you replicated the designs of a U.S. coin, you had to market copy. And he said, well, no, the customers don't want that, so I don't put it on. But it, it was interesting because at first, when she made contact, he said he didn't speak English, and we weren't, weren't getting very much information. And I happened to have a, a friend um, who is in the – actually a medical doctor um, who is Chinese. And he's been in the United States for a long time, but I talked with him and asked him if we wrote questions in English, whether he would translate it into Chinese, and uh, then we would um, uh, scan that and send it to the person that we had made contact. That's how we opened a dialogue with him. And uh, after about six weeks, we were going back sometimes every other day, sending questions. He was responding. Uh, finally, we learned that he did uh, speak and write enough English that we uh, were able to communicate very successfully. And he proudly sent pictures and um, told us all about his operation. And one of the key things we learned is that the United States in the 1920s sent the government of China old presses that had been used in the Denver Mint uh, from the 1870s until actually the end of the production of um, uh, peace dollars. And um, they had, and the Chinese government used these to produce their dollar sized silver coins at that time. Because of political situation there, change in government, they uh, produced different coins, and uh, they just they replaced those old uh, presses. And what they did was to essentially put them in a warehouse. And it wasn't until uh, around 2005 someone discovered those old presses. And uh, the Chinese government sold them for scrap metal. And these enterprising guys bought them. Uh, the presses were never taken apart. They, were, they just bought them literally for the price of the metal in them and put them to good use. That's how they were making the Morgan dollars. 
so successfully. They had gotten their hands on the very presses that the Morgan dollars, the genuine Morgan dollars, had been made on. And so they had people capable of engraving dyes, and they even sent us um, samples of some of their dyes that we photographed. And that led to a series in Coin World in uh, the fall of 2008. And I think that was the first um, revelation to the hobby at wide that uh, that really was a problem on the scene. At that time, he told us that he was the largest of approximately 100 people that were making uh, replica coins in China. And these were really cottage industries. These were two and, and three people shops and sometimes uh, actually one person. Uh, and they were all making dyes or somehow had a connection and they knew what each other were doing. But to give you an example, he said that he could produce a uh, 100,000 coins a month. That was his top production rate. And he was at that time selling in the United States uh, on a good month, a thousand coins. Now, uh, there are, are uh, manufacturers in China that openly advertise on uh, Alibaba, which is the Chinese equivalent of eBay, although it has four times the size uh, in volume uh, of eBay, and it, and it reaches into more than 200 countries. Some of those guys uh, will um, converse with you online, and they openly advertise, for example, that they can make an American Eagle gold bullion one-ounce coin uh, replica, although they don't mark it as replica, so it's a counterfeit. That Pass all the tests. In other words, the typical weight, diameter, um, most of the tests that we use, uh, other than very sophisticated equipment, it would pass as genuine. That they can produce and provide to you um, up to anywhere from 50,000 to uh, 500,000 coins in literally five days of your order. This is gives you some indication of what has happened over since uh, 2008. It, um, it is a product not only of the Internet because they can reach uh, everywhere in the world they, uh, to sell, but also they have the most modern equipment available in the minting industry. Uh, they openly show pictures of their plants. We've identified at least 14 of these modern facilities, and they have the same minting equipment as the U.S. Mint and other world mints. So they can make uh, coins that uh, are very, very deceptive. And that gives you, I think, some understanding of how things have changed literally over the last decade. And the, the proverbial question that we're asked all the time is, how many counterfeits are out there? Nobody knows. What we do see is uh, on it from, from dealers, and we hear this all the time, from dealers across the country, their people are walking in and trying to sell them coins that they have purchased online or they found in flea markets or uh, people have uh, contacted them and said, hey, we'd like to buy your, your family's coin collection and we'll give you gold bars or we'll give you gold coins for grandpa's collection that you you want to get rid of and they meet them in the they make arrangements to meet them in the parking lot of a big box store 
and and um, and exchange real coins for the counterfeit bars and sometimes gold coins or, or other things. Then the people will take them to a coin dealer and say, "I want I want to sell these," only to learn that um, what they have is counterfeit. And the volume that we're seeing is is pretty staggering uh, in terms of how they have permeated throughout our marketplace. Well, there's no doubt about that. Um, I was at Traverse City in Michigan earlier this year at the EAC convention, and I was doing a live stream over the air uh, looking at and discussing the exhibits. When Jack Young pulled me over to look at a counterfeit coin that an experienced collector had picked up from an experienced copper dealer at the show. Uh, but the collector had grown suspicious about it. And Jack, as many know, and I'm sure you know, has spent a great deal of time studying struck counterfeit uh, coins that use genuine coins uh, as a basis to strike a number of almost exact copies. These copies would then be weathered or treated to appear different, but Jack's work shows that the counterfeiters invariably leave telltale markers on the coin that repeat time and time again. So here we are at about as sophisticated and numismatic gathering as exists in the industry, and still deceptive counterfeits dot the landscape, harming collectors and harming dealers. And this wasn't the first instance where I was pulled aside to look at what amounts to a growing crisis within our hobby. Uh, just a few years earlier, I was in attendance at the Central States Numismatic Society's annual convention when Larry Briggs handed me a 1950s common date Washington quarter, and the quarter was in extra fine condition. Everything about the coin, from its look and weight to the silver content, was in line with what you'd expect from a pre-64 quarter. Only one thing was off, and that was the, the reading on the edge of the coin was not correct. Two professional dealers that I was with held the coin in their own hands, but were left unsure until I pointed out the reads. And while there may be little to no benefit in counterfeiting a common date silver quarter and extra fine, the same can't be said for scarcer dates like the 32D or the 32S. But an even bigger problem than collector coins exists, and you report about this in your findings, where you say American bullion coins the American Silver and Gold Eagle, are counterfeited not just on a daily basis, but on an industrial scale. And while there is a market, it's not very big for random date type coins where a counterfeiter might get away with making a few dozen or a few hundred before arousing suspicion. The same can't be said for bullion coins, which have a huge demand. And when a publicly traded company like Alibaba, with a reach of hundreds of millions of potential users, allows the proliferation of fake bullion coins. It's such an egregious set of events that I'm shocked that the federal government hasn't shut this down already. Well, uh, that is precisely why uh, the leadership of a and &A and the uh, Professional Numismatist Guild and uh, ICA came together and informed our task force because uh, we when I say we, I'm, I'm kind of speaking for the industry and, and hobby at large, felt that um, no one in law enforcement was paying any attention to this problem. And so uh, we, uh, right after the task force was formed in January of 2017, went to Washington in early February and sat down with uh, people in the Customs and Border Protection, with the Secret Service, with Homeland Security, with uh, members of Congress that have oversight for the U.S. Mint, and um, and began to to uh, try to focus on this. We also uh, met with with uh, the then acting director of the U.S. Mint, and what we found, especially in law enforcement. Um, Customs and Border Protection had been seeing uh, an unusual number of coins and packages, but they didn't realize they were counterfeit. Uh, and they didn't understand 
the difference between the face value and the market value of coins. For instance, I showed them uh, um, a fake um, one ounce uh, gold uh, American Eagle bullion coin, and that's that uh, a person had loaned to us. And then I showed them a genuine one, and and they said, "But that's a fifty dollar coin. We we can't waste our time with this." And I said, "Wait a minute." This coin, this genuine coin here is sold by the U.S. Mint at that point in time. Uh, it was, uh, sold, the U.S. Mint was selling it for about $1,329 or something like that. And they had no idea. They, uh, it just was not something that they had ever been advised about. Indeed, all of their policy manuals uh, treat, had treated up until that time, um, coins as face value. So, <laughs> that's when we began to realize that we had a challenge in educating law enforcement. Uh, and, and I explained to them, they said, you know, we have, and the Secret Service said, we have to pay attention to $100 bills. And they said, why would you pay attention to this $100 bill that is fake and you've got a fake coin that the genuine is worth 13 times it? When I think about uh, coins that are coming into the country, um, one of the things that comes to mind is like the idea of shipping a monster box of 500 one-ounce gold coins. I imagine that you would have to hire a Brinks truck or some sort of special courier service to transport 500 one ounce gold coins around. But when you think about a similar amount of coins or perhaps even a larger bulk quantity uh, of these supposed gold coins coming into the country, a dead giveaway that something is wrong should be the level of security and insurance attached to the shipment. If you have a case of supposed American gold coins being shipped into the country and they're not insured, it would seem that customs should be clued into the fact that these are obvious fakes. Well, uh, it's interesting because they come in all size packages. And once we uh, we did basic education for for customs and border protection, and and we're working with Secret Service and all, but customs and border protection right away acted. I mean, they got really uh, busy. Uh, at packages, and, and what that you you see is they never, especially on smaller packages, you can put you know a hundred uh, gold coins in a package and it's not very large. It would be heavy, but not large. And they never declare these as coins. It's always um, art uh, artwork or um, metal. Uh, um, uh, I forgot there was another phrase <laughs> that was really kind of uh way out of thinking uh metal objects of of artistic value i think is is the way it was described, but they never declare uh the total value they would say they value them at like a dollar a piece, so if there were fifty coins, they would value it at fifty fifty dollars and so the the value declared uh wasn't setting off a bell and uh, and also the description on the packaging and you have to understand that there are billions of packages flowing into the United States every day and custom and border protection unless they know to be on the lookout for something uh they're not opening every package that comes into the country. And there's a small percentage that gets open. But once they uh, understand that there might be something bogus in these packages and know to look for certain shippers or whatever, and if, and if they open a package as something suspicious, they can hold that package for up to 30 days. And that's where uh, we have... Uh, developed a working relationship with Customs and Border Protection. If they open a package and it's got suspicious coins in it, uh, they can call us 
and we can have an expert to where they open the package, uh, usually within a day, sometimes within hours, and identify whether the coins are genuine or, or counterfeit. And, and if they're counterfeit, then when the what they do, what happens in any package that they hold, they send the person to whom it's addressed a notice and say, we are holding your package. Uh, you must come in and uh, claim this package. And they have a whole procedure. Well, most of the time, the the counterfeit material, nobody ever claims. When, and rarely does someone come in and try to claim it. So what they do, after 30 days, if nobody claims it, they're destroyed if they're uh, counterfeit. Are these packages being shipped directly from the manufacturer to the customer who is buying them for the purpose of defrauding people? Or are they being shipped back and forth via proxies to conceal the seller and the consignee? We've seen both ways. We've seen them direct from the manufacturer. Uh, and we have seen them, uh, uh, when I say we, Customer and Border Protection has has intercepted packages that have been rooted that um, actually they will go from, for instance, China to a European country. The Netherlands is, is uh, one of the hotbeds right now, or to certain Central American countries. And, and they, what they have is a network of repackagers. Um, and the counterfeiter will send it to another country. They have a person there who takes the box out, repackages it, and, and addresses it to someone in the United States. Uh, the same thing happens in Central America. And, and that person, the, they call the repackager, gets so much per box. They just take the box out. And there's usually a double box, and they take the set, uh, box inside, put that in different packaging, and send it on to the address that uh, they're directed to send it to. Um, and and sometimes uh, Customs and Border Protection will let a package go through, and then uh, there is a division of Homeland Security known as HSI. That's Homeland Security Investigations. Then they will actually uh, uh, trace and and put eyes on the ground, literally figuring out who claims that package and what they do with it. And they're under surveillance. And and what they have learned and what they tell us is these sometimes are very large and sophisticated networks, and they often are part of. Uh, uh, money laundering operations, uh, and sometimes they are, are connected with human trafficking as well as money laundering and sometimes even uh, terrorist organizations. So it's not – it has grown in the last decade from a little cottage industry to a very sophisticated uh, network of criminal activity. But, you know, if, if some – Someone is tempted to order these online for one or two or three or four. They'll probably be sent direct. The ones that are part of a network of criminal activity in the United States, that is a different type of, of uh, operation. And we, we've seen packages that are very small. We've seen them large. We have seen them as large as the um, – shipping uh, containers like that come in in the ports. Literally, it looks like a train car load, and one was open uh, about two years ago in the port of uh, Long Beach that was filled with silver dollars. Imagine a freight car full of silver dollars. That's, you have it in all packages, and they're coming through airports ports, they're coming through seaports. You know, when you think about it, everything that you're telling me, and, and it's not a direct corollary, and I hope you or our listeners don't take issue with the comparison. Uh, I'm not trying to conflate the issue, but 
A similar problem exists in the United States on the southern border, where you have a fluid situation with migrants crossing our border and entering into the United States illegally. And although we have a system of federal policing apparatuses in place, and our current president even won the election, I think, in part due to his position on building a wall on the southern border, uh, which would be monumentally expensive and possibly not effective in dealing with the problem, because it deals with the problem once it reaches our border instead of dealing with the underlying issues at their source. The same could be said, I think, about customs trying to stop the proliferation of illicit imports as they come to our shores, instead of using the full weight of the federal government to crack down on these businesses overseas. Where is the effort to smash these business operations, to find out who the customers are and raid these criminal rings? Why is it simply enough to hope that we deal with this problem by having customs agents catch objects here and there during transit. And as, a, as, a, as an interested non-expert observer, this appears to be exactly what's going on. Is this all the government has to offer when it comes to stopping the importation of illegal counterfeits? Well, I think it has to be a, multi, a multi-pronged approach. Stopping material from coming in the border, in through the, the port, is one part of it. But we uh, we also have to go after people who are trafficking in it within the United States. Once the material is in the United States, is uh, finding people who are buying and selling it with knowingly buying and selling uh, counterfeits with criminal uh, intent. Uh, but the the other part of that, and it goes to the heart of the manufacturing. Is to is to um, get cooperation from these governments to crack down on the counterfeiters. Now we have, so far as I know, the U.S. government has not as yet uh, had any significant movement in trying to get the Chinese government to to crack down uh, within its borders. Uh, there are uh, discussions, and um, when I was in Washington last week, uh, there was talk. Uh, I met with several um, staffers from several congressional uh, committees. I know that they're working in the trade legislation, trying to do something uh, uh, with China and, and to focus attention on this. You have to understand that coins are not the only thing counterfeited. Uh, this is a whole, whole side, uh, war, trade, uh, and, and economic war, uh, that we're looking at. When the, the, one of the first sessions in which I met with Customs and Border Protection, uh, you know, I knew about counterfeit Gucci purses and Rolex watch, uh, watches and that kind of stuff, the obvious type stuff that you see. But they said, you know, everything that has a recognizable and popular brand is being counterfeited. They said, give me an example. And they said, one of the largest items that is counterfeited is Sherman toilet paper. He said, you've got to be kidding me. I would have never thought of toilet paper being counterfeited. I said, yes. We intercept huge shipments of counterfeit material like that all the time. And they said everything from that to parts to uh, planes and um, anything that uh, can be manufactured uh, can be uh, uh, counterfeited. So that's the, the kind of it, it, it's a it's a much broader and deeper problem than just coins. So um, it it's a huge problem, and and we have to uh, government has to look deeply into how to stop it uh, and get cooperations from the countries. And by the way, China is not the only country that we're seeing counterfeits come from. Uh, there's they're beginning. We're beginning to see them in uh, some other countries, 
and, it, and it's difficult at this point to know whether or not there are actually manufacturing operations or these or these uh, what we call repackagers, but there's some evidence that there is now um, a manufacturing beginning to spring up in, in some other countries. But, you know, stopping it at the source and, and one of the ways you stop that is is to dry up the marketplace. Uh, if if there are people not wanting the product if, uh, in the United States, then the 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 manufacturers won't have a marketplace. That's the other part of it is arresting people who are trafficking in this country. And we had. Um, uh, a case uh, that that broke just uh, uh, the beginning of the week. Um, it it is a case that um, our our task force was involved in very early, uh, where we got a report from a dealer that a couple had walked in with uh, uh, um, a group of Morgan dollars in all of them. I think there were forty nine. All of them were counterfeit, and they the the uh, dealer said, "Where did you get these?" And they said, "Well, we bought them from uh, an ATS agent." He said, "What are you talking about?" And they showed him a Facebook page, and they said, "This guy said that uh, he was an alcohol, tobacco, and farm uh, firearms agent, and he had been a collector for a long time." And he was selling uh, coins as as a, a, a second job, a business. And so, through Facebook, they met him, and he arranged to uh, to meet meet them. Well, the dealer called me, and I called our contacts within law enforcement, and they uh, immediately interviewed the couple. And said, um, uh, "I wonder if you could contact him." And he said, "Well, we already have an appointment. Uh, we talked to him when we bought these because he told us he had some more coins that that we should look at, and we have an appointment to meet him in two days." And they said, "Law enforcement said perfect." So they set up a sting operation, and that's how they nabbed this guy. And uh, turns out, he had never been. Uh, a member of uh, ATF. He had a fake badge, and that's how he was gaining the trust of his victims. And the investigation began there. It has taken a year to get that case uh, through the courts. He finally pleaded guilty uh, in the announcement from the U.S. attorney uh, came Monday. Uh, the sentencing will be in October, and that's when we will get more details about how extensive uh, this guy's operation was. You know, I, I, I've thought about it. Uh, we got the press release that your group put out a few weeks ago. And again, we were talking just a minute ago about a shipping trailer filled with fake Morgan dollars. And, and now we're talking about one individual where millions of dollars of government money was spent to go through the legal process, as was his right to receive it. And this is to stop a small scale, by the sound of it, a small scale operation. Nothing of the size of the sophisticated organized crime endeavor that you mentioned earlier. And, and it still seems like, at the end of the day, we can prosecute guys like these, and these are victories, I'm not trying to take anything away from it, but it doesn't stop the problem. It takes one guy off the street. I don't know that his victim is ever going to be made whole in terms of the money that was stolen from him. But that doesn't stop the means of production. This guy is a drop in the bucket compared to the much bigger issue of what's going on to undermine our bullion program in America. I think yeah. what you will find in, in October, um, it will be, uh, there's some information that I'm not at liberty to release right now. Uh, we have followed this case, and in fact, um, um, one of, uh, well, actually three people from our expert network 
has worked with law enforcement looking at the material and valuing it as if it had been genuine. Uh, when the, when this case, be, all of the details become public, it will be the largest counterfeiting case that we have known about in U.S. history. And it's, it's one guy. That's what's so scary about it. So you're saying, uh, that what this guy did went far beyond, uh, selling 49 fake Morgan dollars. It, it was a very, it is a very sophisticated operation. And there are millions and millions of dollars uh, of items. And we are working right now. This is kind of a little um, news story in and of itself. Uh, we are working with law enforcement and believe that they will make available some of this material for a special exhibit uh, at the World's Fair of Money that's coming up in August in Philadelphia to so people will understand the the full breadth of material that is fake that's on the marketplace. Uh, and you're right, this is one guy. What we're watching very carefully is we hope that he's prosecuted at the at the full extent of the law. If uh he he pleaded guilty to impersonating a federal officer in one count of buying and importing um, counterfeits. You have to understand that the government will try to get these people to plea, uh, that they will accept a, a guilty plea of maybe one or two counts. That is a lot less expensive to the government than going through a trial, which could take two years and as you're talking about millions of dollars and I'm sure the, the time that has been spent on this case and the investigation and documentation of it has cost considerable. However, the next step is to get the judiciary to take the counterfeiting seriously. There's a potential of getting 18 years in federal prison. I would like to see the judge giving the full 18 years to send a message to people in this country who are tempted to get involved in this, that there are consequences. This is, I am hoping that he doesn't get off with a little slap on the wrist because the damage that this one individual could have done, and we don't know the extent of how many people were defrauded. We have uh, in, a, in the Bill of Indictment that they list three uh, victims. These were the people that we knew about, and I have no um, – I, I don't think that these were his first victims. I think he had been operating for some time. But, um, you know, the pro one of the huge problems is that, that uh, most of our law enforcement is being, is being sent to the southern border. The people that we work have been working with in Customs and Border Protection – uh, in some active cases that they are working on six weeks ago, uh, all of them were sent to the southern border. They had to drop the cases they were investigating, and because there's not enough agents to deal with the problem on the southern border, they have all been dispatched on special assignment to the southern border. Let's talk about Philadelphia for a minute and the a and a you know I, I love the world's fair of money. Uh, if you've never been to one, it's a really magical U.S. coin show, and you should go, and you should get involved in the ANA. It's great that it's in Philadelphia, where the Philadelphia Mint is, uh, and I'm sure by talking to Gary Atkins and others that you're going to see things on display at this show that may never be shown again. Uh, but having said that, celebrating the Mint's great, but the Mint has a huge problem. Uh, actually, it has myriad problems, uh, not the least of which is that coins are becoming obsolete because we have made no attempt to reform our coinage laws to take into account the diminished purchasing power of coins or to introduce higher value coins that would actually circulate. But an even bigger problem uh, that relates to what we're talking about with this counterfeit issue is that they have created hundreds of millions of bullion coins that can be counterfeited in a very deceptive manner and are being counterfeited now on a wholesale scale 
and our mint, because it's always been very conservative when it comes to altering the designs of its coins, now lags behind in security features for these two hugely important bullion coins. It lags behind the mint to the north, uh, to several of the larger uh, European mints as well. Uh, and while we would benefit greatly by a change of design uh, to account for the need for added security, we also have to take into account that more than 30 years of product exists in the marketplace. So how do we face the reality that we're now being confronted with, with fake bullion coins in a mature market where hundreds of millions of coins are already in the hands of collectors and investors, a fact that won't change even if new designs are coming down the pipeline? Well, um, one of the um, important meetings that uh, I had last week in D.C. was with our new Mint Director, David Ryder. And uh, you're probably aware um, that David was uh, Mint Director uh, in the, for a brief period um, at the end of um, – George H.W. Bush's uh, term, and he was director for about 18 months. And then with the change in administrations, David left and went to the private sector and has spent the last uh, more than 25 years in the security sector, both with paper money as well as coinage. So we have the advantage of having a, a person come in uh, as director of the U.S. Mint now that doesn't have to take a year learning what the U.S. Mint is about, but he also uh, has a very deep knowledge of anti-counterfeiting technology. And I was very, very pleased to hear that he has already formed an internal task force, has, is already investigating uh, anti-counterfeiting technology, and I, I fully expect uh, him to move very quickly uh, in bringing U.S. products, U.S. coins um, into the to the 21st century with technology to protect. Now, you you bring up an exceedingly important point. We have 30 years of coinage out there in the marketplace. There are technologies under development that I'm aware of that you could indeed protect earlier coins. Uh, my guess is if the U.S. Mint were to come out with a highly sophisticated technology uh, and go into production with its new coinage, a lot of these coins would flow back into the marketplace uh, and could uh, be uh, and, the, and the precious metals melted and make new coins. I, I think that would stimulate the marketplace in, in some respects. Um, but it it uh, will be very interesting to see how this plays out. I, I don't think that has happened. For instance, when the Canadian Mint introduced uh, some new technology to protect its uh, precious metals, uh, bullion coins, uh, I believe it was in what, 2016, 15, 16. Uh, I don't think they had a lot of, of coins, older coins flowing back in. However, uh, at this, this stage in the threat that we're under right now, I would not be surprised, uh, as the, the world meant, um, we, uh, just formed a special work group within the task force for the Royal Mint and the uh, Canadian Royal Mint, the Australian Royal Mint, the Perth Mint, which is a large maker of gold bullion products, uh, the South African Mint, and the Austrian Mint have all joined, and we hope that the uh, United States Mint will, will be a part of that work group uh, very soon now. Uh, and they are, uh, I think, in the vanguard of the mints, working on technology to, produce, uh, to protect coins. And uh, I think you, once they introduce it into the bullion coins, I think uh, you will also see it uh, 
come online with uh, commemorative coins and actually our circulation coins because it's, it's not talked about very uh, uh, very much, but circulation coins are also being being counterfeited. So I think you're going to see some changes in our coins, and um, I, I would not be surprised to see uh, design changes come with that. Put your future hat on for a second. Speculate. Where do you think we'll be on this issue in uh, three to five years? Uh, I would hope that we will have very sophisticated and counterfeiting technology in all of our coins. And with that, um, as as the public understands the the change, it should uh, focus anew on coins. Uh, I think you're probably very aware that when the general public at large becomes aware of a change in coins, it stimulates interest and it stimulates people uh, engaging in in uh, collecting coins. We saw that happen with the state coins, uh, state quarters, uh, and there was a, a huge marketing campaign from the Mint. Uh, what happened was that, and, uh, and we saw this also with the dollar coin, the Federal Reserve uh, stopped uh, the the process of sending the coins out through the banking system. The United States makes uh, mint makes coins, but they don't distribute coins. The, all of our coins are distributed through the Federal Reserve in the uh, banking system. And if the Federal Reserve does not cooperate, then we can't get the coins out in the public's hands. Uh, the state quarters, uh, most most of those were pushed out through the the banking system. But the the National Parks coins, by and large, the U.S. public doesn't know they exist. We in the collecting community know it. Uh, The same is true once they stopped uh, uh, sending the the, uh, Sacagawea dollar through the banking system. It stopped. And and all of the Native American uh, reverses and uh, they, that coinage, general public doesn't know it exists. So when we introduce anti-counterfeiting technology in our coins, and if whether or not we get new designs or we just have the message, hey, your coins are now protected, that has to be an all-out effort from the Mint and the Treasury to get the public's attention, much like the the BEP did when they began putting anti-counterfeiting technology in our paper money. So is it your understanding then uh, that the Mint Director is interested not only in putting in place anti-counterfeiting technology on bullion coins, but also on circulating coins? Because, you know, circulating coins are also counterfeited, just not at the same scale. Yeah, I, I think eventually... Uh, we're going to see it, it on, on all coins. And, and you're, you're zeroing in on the fact that it will come in the precious metals sector, the bullion coins first, because they are the high value coins and they have definitely been targeted by the counterfeiters. And, uh, they have to pay attention to those immediately. Uh, but, Uh, I think over the next five years, uh, I would not be surprised to see uh, this anti-counterfeiting technology used in every coin that's made by the United States Mint. And and, uh, you will see uh, very new and sophisticated technologies uh, being used by other sovereign mints throughout the world and and also private mints. The private mints uh, with their uh, bars and rounds, they're being hit uh, too. Um, we've had discussions and actually the Sunshine Mint, uh, the Silvertown, um, the, uh, all of those, there are 11 private mints in the United States, every one of them uh, we've had contact with, and, and they fight counterfeiting every day. Um, the products that they put in the marketplace, and, and some of them produce coinage for smaller countries. So, 
um, it, this is industry wide uh, that uh, people are are paying attention have to, and they know that they have to to get ahead of the curve, so to speak. Well, what's on the line for the Mint and the federal government is that the silver and gold eagles are backed by the legal denomination that is stamped on each coin and their credibility that these bullion coins are sold as described. And it erodes that trust by having an issue as big as this go unchecked for as long as, you know, I know members of the numismatic community have been aware of it. So that's what's at stake for them. Oh, well, I, I totally agree with you. And I think uh, that's why you're going to see um, uh, the Met, U.S. Mint now act much faster than it has in years prior Unfortunately, we had the situation where the U.S. Mint was without a director for seven years. And, um, you know, there are some very good people who work at the U.S. Mint. But when you have an organization that large, there are, what, about 2,200 employees throughout the U.S. Mint system. And when you have acting people uh, uh that don't feel that they have the full authority to go ahead, they will pretty much kind of keep things going as it as it has been done, but they don't step out and make bold new decisions. That's the difference by having a presidentially appointed mint director. Uh, that mint director uh, works for the Secretary of the Treasury and has a direct access to the Secretary of the Treasury and to the president, because as you point out, it makes the the coins that uh, are guaranteed and backed by the U.S. government um, in the same way with our paper money. So very visible, and and uh, it has been a very neglected area for the last seven or eight years in. And as we were talking earlier, there has been a sea change over the last decade. And um, U.S. Mint is is uh, really uh, has a huge challenge. Uh, but I think and I hope that we have the right person uh, in the directorship now to to move quickly, decisively, and and to to do the job that we really need done. Well, Beth, I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about this and share what you are working on now. And thank you for your career serving this hobby, something you've done a remarkable job of. I think this is one of the biggest issues, you know, counterfeiting is one of the biggest issues that we face as an industry. Uh, It's an erosion of trust. Uh, and it takes trust to buy a coin that says on it that it is worth one cent and yet pay thousands or even millions of dollars for it. And if you don't trust that it's real, then that's a big problem uh, for the rare coin market. And uh, on the bullion side, uh, many people have moved to uh, precious metals as a way of diversifying their assets. Uh, again, not necessarily trusting paper money as a safe haven for their wealth. And if you can't trust that you're actually getting gold and silver, then I think it takes that entire buying strategy and calls it into question. What we're seeing is that technology and commerce and the ways that we interact with each other has developed much faster than our means to regulate, trade, and enforce rules. And if you don't have competent leadership that's technologically aware, and if you don't have honesty in your working relationships between countries, where you have mechanisms in place to enforce each other's rules, you end up with situations like this. And, and while, you know, there may always be a criminal element, uh, you know, the counterfeiting that we see today is far more pernicious and widespread than crafty counterfeiters knocking off gold coins that we saw in the 1970s. Uh, this is a fundamental undermining of the United States bullion coin program. And, and actually, as you said, it goes far beyond coins to things as inconsequential as toilet paper to designer T-shirts, you know. The American economy is such that Americans have shown a a real willingness to pay significant premiums for all sorts of uh, consumer goods. And it is this uh, eagerness uh, to do so that has allowed a wholesale violation of trust on the part of the unscrupulous and underregulated businesses overseas. And it it has to stop. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, I am, am so encouraged and actually so thankful for the the many volunteers in our hobby 
uh, and, you know, collectors and dealers and the leaders who have spent uh, an enormous amount of time and energy working uh, with us in the task force. And you spoke of Jack Young. Jack took a couple of days of vacation last week and came to Washington and was with me in meetings and to explain just how sophisticated the counterfeiters are. And um, I, I think Jack had fun. Uh, we, we educated some folks there. And uh, it, it, uh, I think it's a, uh, it's a job that has to be done, but um, it, it is very encouraging to me as to uh, how willingly and uh, just how many people have stepped forward to volunteer their time. We have 93 experts around the country now that and within uh, a few minutes' notice literally are willing to drop everything and go and assist uh, law enforcement in identifying uh, the counterfeit coins and helping them and valuing and are willing to serve as expert witnesses. Um, and, you know, government can do things, but we as citizens and we as responsible people in the hobby, we have a role to play, and I'm very proud that uh, people are really stepping up and, and joining forces. Um, this is a problem that has to be dealt with, and I think um, – we're, you know, we're we're certainly not at that I can call it winning the war, but we're we're marching, and um, I, I think it's it's going to be it's not something that's going to be solved overnight. We're we're in for the long haul. It's going to take uh, years to to get all of this counterfeit material out of our our marketplace. I wish you the best of luck, Beth, and again, thank you very much. Well, thank you, and uh, hopefully um, people will make plans to come to Philadelphia for the World's Fair of Money. Lots of things are going to be happening there, and um, we, we look forward to seeing people there. If you enjoyed this podcast or are concerned about the issue of counterfeits, please share it with your friends. Very important information. Uh, and remember, you can download all 100-plus episodes of the award-winning Coin Week podcast for free on the iTunes Store. You can also stream online at CoinWeek.com and on our YouTube channel. For Coin Week, I'm editor Charles Morgan. Until next time, happy collecting.